Well, a local wedding videographer captured what appeared to be an unidentified flying object in the Toledo night sky. I'm a video he recorded with the drone while working as a videographer at a wedding near downtown Toledo is going viral. So we shot all day long. We take the drone. Shortly after, the object passes just a few feet away from the plane. At that moment, the pilot realizes he might have recorded the most solid evidence of these mysterious ships. This Starting off this countdown, we have the disappearing Air Force jet. Over the years, a number of military officials have disappeared while exploring UFOs. Take this case, for example. On November 23rd, 1953, the U.S. Air Defense Command noticed a blip on their radar in a restricted airspace over Lake Superior. Since it was in restricted space, an Air Force jet took off to investigate. There were two crew members on board. The men never returned home from the mission. So while out investigating the blip, they got right to the spot where it should be. On the radar, it showed that they were right on top of this blip but they couldn't see a craft anywhere. Then ground control saw the blip veer off and vanish, as did the men inside of the jet. The United States Air Force, US Coast Guard, and Canadian Air Forces all conducted an extensive search and rescue to try and find the men, but this was sadly unsuccessful. In fact, they didn't even find signs of wreckage. To this day, no one knows what happened to the mysterious UFO, the men, or their jet. Moving on at number nine, we have the Tehran UFO. In the early hours on September 19th, 1976, a shiny object was reported hovering in the skies above Tehran by at least four different people. As a result, two Imperial Iranian Air Force F-4 Phantom II jets set off to explore this mystery object. However, while nearing this object, their craft began to fail. They were going to open fire on it, but their weapon system was down. Not only that, but officers described the light as, and I quote, flashing with intense red, green, orange, and blue lights, so bright that I was not able to see its body. What's weird is that as soon as their jets moved away from the craft, their systems returned to normal. He then watched the craft, and I quote, slow down and land gently on the ground, radiating a high, bright light. The next day, they explored the area where the craft landed, and a number of residents said that they heard a loud noise and a bright flash of light during the night. In our eighth spot, we have the six soldiers. This next UFO encounter took place in North Korea in 1951 during the Korean War and impacted a number of Korean soldiers. So in May of 1951, Korean soldiers were preparing to bomb a nearby village when they were greeted by a strange craft. According to the men, the craft emitted some form of a ray that made their airburst start to explode. One man then said that they were attacked by some ray that was emitting pulses. Like a lighthouse light, you could see when it was aimed directly at you and when it wasn't. Well, after this weird attack, the men were left sick and had to be taken to the hospital. Some say that they were attacked by a UFO. Others say that they were attacked by some sort of death ray. To this day, we still don't know what attacked them and what caused them to fall so ill. Moving on at number seven, we have Skinwalker Ranch. Now this place has been known to be filled with supernatural activity. Not only do evil shape-shifting entities roam the land, but apparently aliens and UFOs do too. According to the original owner, Terry Sherman, him and his wife had a number of chilling experiences there. This ultimately led to them selling his plot of land. For starters, in June of 1996, mysterious crop circles kept appearing. Then, on a number of occasions, they saw UFOs hovering around their property. The worst is when they kept finding their cattle completely mutilated. This was not done by an animal, as it was done without bloodshed, and the cuts were very precise. For years, the government and military have been exploring Skinwalker Ranch to try and make sense of this situation. But they haven't, honestly. In our sixth spot, we have Falcon Lake. This incident has been named one of the most famous Canadian UFO encounters. It all started on May 20th, 1967, when two glowing objects descended from the sky near Falcon Lake in Manitoba. This was witnessed by a man named Stefan Michalak. Apparently, one of the weird crafts landed close to him, so he decided to investigate like a dummy, which was a terrible idea. When he got close to it, it suddenly shot back into the sky. 
The beam of light from the craft as it took off set Stefan's clothes on fire. He was left with a bunch of strange burns on his body, including burn marks on his chest and a pattern of dots. Following the encounter, he fell ill. Now, some people believe the story to be a hoax, but he literally has burn marks on his body and scorched clothes as proof. So it makes you think otherwise. Just starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Project Grudge Report 13. Okay, I've read quite a few different UFO sighting stories and stories of alleged alien abductions, and this is fully one of the most terrifying I have ever heard of. So basically, the story starts off in March of 1956 when Jonathan P. Lovett was assisting Major William Cunningham in the White Sands Missile Testing Grounds near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The pair were out searching for debris from a recent rock rocket test when Major Cunningham heard a loud scream. His first thought was that Sergeant Lovett had been bitten by a snake, so he went around to help aid his partner, and this is when he allegedly saw something that he never expected. He recounted seeing the sergeant being dragged away by some sort of long serpentine arm that had wrapped around his legs. Whatever this creature was, it was connected to a hovering disc that was in the air about 15 feet away. The Major stood there in horror as he watched this creature and the sergeant retreat into the craft, which then rose vertically into the sky. Of course, he radioed for help, and while he was taken to the hospital for observation after this, search teams were sent out immediately. It wouldn't happen until three days later that they would find the body of Sergeant Lovett only 10 miles away from the site where he was said to have disappeared from. The autopsy performed on him later also only raised more questions than answers as his body was severely harmed. So of course there was an investigation that happened and many people claim that this investigation was detailed in a 600 page document labeled Project Grudge Report 13. But the problem with this is that no official information on Report 13 exists, and the US government denies its very existence at all. Though grudge reports 1 through 12 have been declassified, along with report 14, no official mention or accounting of report 13 exists, and the story solely relies on secondhand accounts of this horrible incident. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Air Force disappearance. On the night of November 23rd, 1953, near the Canadian US border, the United States Air Defense Command noticed a blip on their radar where there shouldn't have been one. This was showing that the there was some sort of unidentified object that was in restricted airspace over Lake Superior. In response to this, an F-89C Scorpion jet was sent to investigate with two crew members. First Lieutenant Felix Moncla was piloting the craft, while second Lieutenant Robert Wilson was observing the radar. Once in the air, the pair had trouble tracking the object, which kept changing its course, which then led to ground control helping to direct them. The jet pursued the unknown object for 30 minutes as it closed in on it at 500 miles per hour. After a while, the two blips on the radar, one being the unknown object and the other being the investigating jet, converged into one point, and then suddenly, the radar return from the F-89 simply disappeared from ground control's radar scope. Shortly after this, the radar blip that was from the unidentified object also veered off and then vanished. The men who were sent to investigate in the jet never returned from the mission, and there was never any wreckage found signifying an accident despite extensive searches. The men and the jet just disappeared completely. It is said that the explanations for the disappearance that have been released throughout the years have changed and flip-flopped in what they say happened, so at this point, no one has any idea what really went on here. In our number 8 spot today, we have Dr. Brian O'Leary. Dr. Brian O'Leary is a former NASA astronaut and Princeton physics professor, and he has been quoted as saying that there is abundant evidence that we are being contacted, that civilizations have been monitoring us for a very long time, and that their appearance is bizarre from any type of traditional materialistic western point of view. Apparently he also said that these visitors use the technologies of consciousness, that use droids, that use co-rotating magnetic disks for their propulsion systems, which seems to be the common denominator of the UFO phenomenon. I obviously have no idea how I could possibly substantiate these claims, but they certainly are interesting, regardless of what you personally believe. And based on his education and work experience, it really is quite compelling. This could, of course, just be nonsense in order to stir up the masses 
sources, but it could also be someone who's finally telling us all the truth, but we're just too skeptical to believe it. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Roswell incident. This whole rigmarole started in 1947 when some sort of crash took place near a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. Shortly after this, the Roswell Army Airfield released a statement saying that they had recovered a flying disc from the ranch, but the Army quickly retracted the statement and said that it wasn't that, but instead it was just a conventional weather balloon. This was a little sketchy, but most people let it slide until the 1970s. What happened in the 70s is that a retired lieutenant colonel began to speak out. In an interview with a UFO researcher, he said that the weather balloon story was a cover up and that alien remains were actually recovered from the crash site. There were both first and second hand witnesses who claimed that not only were there at least one, but possibly more alien spacecrafts that had crashed at the scene, that there were also extraterrestrial remains that were recovered by the military who then began to engage in a cover up. In 1994, the story changed from a weather balloon to a nuclear test surveillance balloon from Project Mogul, and it was stated that the stories of the alien bodies were probably just test dummies that had been dropped from high altitudes. I'm not gonna lie, the whole thing sounds a little sketchy. I obviously wasn't there, so I can't say for certain what happened, but someone is definitely lying. I'm just not sure who. In our number six spot today, we have the Stephenville UFO. In January of 2008, in the small town of Stephenville, Texas, a bunch of residents all saw something in the sky that they couldn't believe. In the beginning, it appeared to be white lights in the sky that were first in a single arc, but then they quickly moved to form two parallel lines. It was estimated that the lights were spanning about a mile long and half of a mile wide, but the craziest part is that it was flying at 3,000 miles per hour, which is similar to the speed of a fighter jet, but there was no sound reported at all. The government chalked this sighting up to a US Air Force flight operation, but many of the residents who saw this event on that day were absolutely not convinced and truly felt like they were lied to. Some even explained that what they saw was too technologically advanced for the human civilization. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Lake Huron UFO. Just this past weekend, on Sunday, February 12th, US officials were able to confirm that the Air Force and the National Guard had downed a UFO that was seen over Lake Huron, which has a shoreline that is shared by the US state Michigan, as well as the Canadian province of Ontario, where I am right now. Representative Alyssa Slotkin, a Michigan Democrat, not only confirmed the downing, but also took to Twitter to write, quote, great work by all who carried out this mission both in the air and back at headquarters. We're all interested in exactly what this object was and its purpose. Of course, this only worked to fuel rumors over what exactly this UFO could actually be or where it came from. The Department of Defense is said to have been tracking the flying object for some time before it decided that action needed to be taken in order to get the object out of airspace. So far, while there still hasn't been any confirmations of what exactly this object was, it has been described as a quote, octagonal structure. Right now, recovery efforts of the debris is underway, but as of filming this, there have been no official reports of what exactly this UFO might have been or where it came from. In our number nine spot today, we have the Yukon UFO. On Saturday, February 11th, just a day before the Lake Huron UFO, a US fighter jet shot down this unidentified flying object that was in the skies above Yukon, a Canadian territory. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau took to Twitter to let Canadians know that he had ordered the quote, takedown of an unidentified object that violated Canadian airspace. In an effort to take down the UFO, both Canadian and US aircrafts were scrambled and Air Force members took to the sky to execute the successful downing of the object. Canadian forces are now working to recover and analyze the wreckage of this UFO to hopefully identify its origin. The North American Aerospace Defense Command, also known as NORAD, had initially detected the object flying at a high altitude over Alaska on Friday evening, and on Saturday is when it crossed into Canadian airspace. Pentagon Press Secretary Brigadier General Pat Ryder explained that, quote, a US F-22 shot down the object in Canadian territory using an AIM 9X missile following close coordination between US and Canadian authorities. Both Canadians and Americans are on high alert with this UFO considering it is just one of the many that have been taken out of airspace in the last couple weeks alone. Like I mentioned before, right now the Canadian Armed Forces and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are working on recovering the wreckage, but the FBI will also be working closely with the RCMP during the investigation. In our number 8 spot today we have the Alaska UFO. Okay, we're doing like a reverse timeline for these few points because now we are talking about the Alaska UFO that was shot down one day before the Yukon UFO. It was like Alaska, Yukon, Lake Huron. On February 10th, an F-22 US fighter jet shot down an unidentified object over the waters near Alaska. 
The object was said to have been caught flying at an altitude of 40,000 feet and was deemed a quote reasonable threat to aviation, which is why the orders were given to take it down. The object was first detected the day before and a flyby happened on the Thursday it was seen before the second flyby and takedown which took place on the Friday. Here's where things get really suspicious though. The pilots who were sent up to investigate and take down the UFO all gave differing reports of what it was that they saw. Some of the pilots even say that the UFO interfered with their sensors and others claimed that they couldn't see any kind of propulsion system on the object which poses the question how could it have possibly been just casually cruising 40,000 feet in the air. In a statement over the weekend the US Northern Command said that they have no new information about the objects quote capabilities purpose or origin and they also explained that the recovery efforts are being slowed down by the icy conditions in the region. The National Security Council coordinator for strategic communications John Kirby said of the object quote we're calling this an object because that's the best description we have right now. He continued to say quote we don't know who owns it whether it's state owned or corporate owned or privately owned we just don't know. People are especially concerned about this UFO in particular because of the important military sites in Alaska as well as its very close proximity to its neighboring countries. In our number seven spot today we have the balloon. On February 4th it became public knowledge that officials were monitoring a strange object in the sky that they claimed had entered airspace above Alaska on January 28th. They monitored the object as it later drifted from Idaho southeast to the Carolinas before the decision was made to take it down. This operation was carried out and the object was shot down. As it turns out this object was realized to be some kind of a balloon. The balloon is said to have been about the size of three buses and it was flying at an altitude of around 60,000 to 65,000 feet. Authorities were able to discover that the origin of this object was from China but there are conflicting accounts of what its purpose might have been. China has maintained that the device was a civilian aircraft that strayed into American airspace but senior American officials are seemingly believing that the balloon was originally supposed to conduct surveillance. Many believe that the spying was to be done over US military bases in Guam and Hawaii but winds carried it off course to Alaska, Canada and finally the United States mainland where it was then shot down. Whatever this balloon was for I'm just glad that we know what this one was and where it had come from because some of these other recent UFOs are just too mysterious. In our number six spot today we have the classified report. We are just scratching the surface of our time in 2023 but already there were some crazy announcements including one regarding a report that was delivered to Congress from the Director of National Intelligence. Basically since August of last year there has been a total of 510 quote unidentified aerial phenomena observed in protected airspace or near sensitive facilities. According to the report 26 of these were described as drones, 163 were labeled as balloons or balloon like entities and 6 were described as clutter whatever that means. This is all fine and well but the concern sets in when we consider that this leaves 171 sightings unaccounted for some of which quote appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics or performance capabilities. It's also important to note that the majority of these sightings are coming directly from Navy and Air Force pilot. Here's the thing what we as the public know is only a 12 page declassified summary of the actual real secret report that was delivered to Congress. Only time will tell if we ever find out what the rest of the report includes or what will happen with further investigation into the 171 sightings but hopefully if answers do arise one day we'll find out. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have they might have died off. This one is a bit disappointing to be honest okay bad news first good news later but it's basically just a theory that it's probably pretty likely that there were aliens at some point but since the universe is so old they might have already died out. All life and cultures rise and fall and researchers put together a model in recent years that would give more insight into the likelihood of this theory. They took things into account like sun like stars that are not too close or too far from planets that are similar to earth as well as how frequently there are deadly radiation blasting supernovas which of course could prove to be a huge problem for life forms as well as the time that it takes for intelligent life to evolve provided all the conditions are right. And once the evolution has taken place how long it would take for a tool bearing form of life to then destroy itself. That's a lot of factors to consider and through all of this it was found that the highest likelihood of life before ours in the Milky Way emerged around five and a half billion years ago which would place that before our planet was even formed. This of course would have provided plenty of time for all of the events I just mentioned to have occurred. Not only this but with a recent James Webb telescope discovery we might be learning that galaxies existed long 
long before what we previously thought. James Webb has been using its incredibly powerful technology to glimpse back into the earliest moments of our universe, and just this week it was announced that there are some distant galaxies that predate what we once thought was possible. This is all to say that there are now millions of extra years that have been added to the timeline where some form of life may have developed. And who knows, maybe these life forms do still exist, but we are just too far away for us to reach. In our number 9 spot today we have the Roswell Incident. One of the most famous alien conspiracy stories of all time, this whole rigmarole started in 1947 when some sort of crash took place near a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico. Shortly after this, the Roswell Army Airfield released a statement saying that they had recovered a flying disc from the ranch, but the Army quickly retracted the statement and said that it wasn't that, but instead was a conventional weather balloon. Alright, heard that before. This was a little sketchy, but most people let it slide until the 1970s. What happened in the 70s is that a retired lieutenant colonel began to speak out. In an interview with a UFO researcher, he said that the weather balloon story was a cover up and that alien remains were actually recovered from the crash site. There were both first and second hand witnesses who claimed that not only were there at least one, but possibly more alien spacecrafts that had crashed at the scene, but also that extraterrestrial remains were also recovered by the military who then began to engage in a cover up. In 1994, the story changed from a weather balloon to a nuclear test surveillance balloon from Project Mogul, and it was stated that the stories of the alien bodies were probably just test dummies that had been dropped from high altitudes. I'm not gonna lie, the whole thing sounds a little sketchy. I obviously wasn't there, so I can't say for certain what happened, but someone is definitely lying about it, that's all I know. In our number 8 spot today we have the radio signals. Basically, we're getting radio signals from somewhere, but we just aren't quite sure where. It started in 2007 when we began getting what are called fast radio bursts, and they are a totally mysterious phenomenon to scientists. These bursts are only a few milliseconds long, but they emit more energy than the sun does in 24 hours. All of this is already super cool and interesting, but here's an even crazier thing about them. The main thing that we know about these bursts is that they're coming from outside of our own galaxy. Space is very cool and very unbelievable. This obviously has led a lot of experts to believe that it could possibly be coming from an advanced civilization that is quite far away, and they may be trying to contact us, but we just don't have the technology to interpret the signals. Maybe one day scientists will figure out a way to accept whatever message it is they are trying to send, or maybe one day we'll get a visit from them and then they'll be mad at us for not answering their messages and just leaving them on red. Either way, it's all very cool and very interesting. In our number 7 spot today we have the cigar shaped UFO. Alright, let's set the stage. It's 2.45am on July 24th, 1948 and there are 20 passengers aboard a twin engine propeller plane that is at 5,000 feet being flown from Houston to Atlanta by pilot Clarence S. Childs and co-pilot John B. Witted. Out of the 20 passengers on board, 19 of them are asleep at these early morning hours, and everything seems to be going as per usual, until it wasn't. The two pilots and the one passenger who was awake all witnessed the same thing about 20 miles southeast of Montgomery, Alabama. About a week after the incident, the pilot explained what he had seen by saying, quote, It was clear there were no wings present, that it was powered by some jet or other type of power, shooting flame from the rear some 50 feet. There were two rows of windows which indicated an upper and lower deck, and from inside these windows a very bright light was glowing. Underneath the ship there was a blue glow of light. By his estimates, he watched the UFO for about 10 seconds before it completely vanished. The co-pilot gave a similar explanation and also added, quote, the object was cigar shaped and seemed to be about 100 feet in length. The fuselage appeared to be about three times the circumference of a B-29 fuselage. It had two rows of windows, an upper and a lower. The windows were very large and seemed square. They were white with light which seemed to be caused by some type of combustion. I asked Captain Childs what we had just seen and he said that he didn't know. While this is obviously very strange and peculiar, what has driven UFO enthusiasts even more is the fact that this strange sighting was of course later investigated by the US government, but the results of that investigation have allegedly been mostly destroyed. Does that mean that maybe they found something they aren't willing to share yet? Some believe that perhaps the pilots and passenger witnessed a secret Soviet spycraft, but others believe it definitely was something of the extraterrestrial variety. In our number 6 spot today we have the NASA Viking experiment. So this is one of the more debated ones on today's list, but that does not mean that it is in evidence. In 1976, NASA's Viking landers tested the soil on Mars and found some chemicals that could be attributed to signs of life. The soil was mixed with radioactive carbon labeled nutrients and then tested for the production of radioactive methane 
methane gas. The test ended up receiving a positive result, which could indicate that something in the soil is metabolizing the nutrients to produce the gas. Despite further efforts, there still hasn't been any life found, but one of the scientists who worked on this original project, and others as well, stand by what they found and argue that the technology at the time wasn't advanced enough to find the key evidence of life. Hopefully with the Perseverance rover that is, you know, digging in the soil up there now, maybe now is the time that we have the technology to find the true answers behind this one. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Levelin. This incident took place in 1957 in Levelin, Texas, and actually was the inspiration for a scene in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In the real life incident, dozens of citizens from across the city began individually reporting seeing a rocket or a strange set of lights or some sort of unidentified object, but that wasn't it. Whatever these citizens were seeing was also reportedly interfering with their vehicles as well. Engines were suddenly just dying out and lights were cutting out. If this happened to just one or two, this could have been some kind of a weird coincidence, but it was way too many instances. Something else had to have been at play. The authorities at first thought that the reports were a hoax until they too saw the strange lights as they began to investigate. This is where Project Blue Book came in and they started to investigate and they came up with quite the conclusion. They claimed that whatever had happened here was simply just a case of an electrical storm and ball lightning that caused the lights and the mechanical malfunctions. That's super reasonable, but the catch with this explanation is that there were no reported storms or thunderstorms or rain in the area that night at all. I'm just saying, something here clearly isn't adding up quite right. In our number 9 spot today we have the Belgium wave. Near the ending of November of 1989, citizens of Belgium were shocked to report seeing a big triangular UFO hovering in the sky. Aside from these reports from the visual witnesses however, there wasn't any physical evidence supporting the existence of the UFO. Flash forward to a few months later in March of 1990 however, and new sightings began to pop up, but this time their presence was being confirmed by two military ground radar stations. Here's where things get really strange though. Two F-16 fighter jets were sent out to investigate what the hell was going on, and this is when the pilots found that they couldn't see anything visually, but their radars were able to spot the target. While trying to keep track of these objects, the UFOs were moving way too fast, and the pilots ended up losing track of them. In the end, there were about 13,500 people who witnessed this UFO incident, which has made it one of the most widely experienced UFO sightings of the modern era. The Belgian Air Force has no idea what it was that they had witnessed, but they thankfully did acknowledge that some sort of unknown activity had taken place instead of just trying to sweep it under the rug and pretend like nothing ever happened. In our number 8 spot today we have the Chicago UFO. This UFO sighting comes from November 7th, 2006 and it was at the O'Hare International Airport in Chicago. Flight 446 was getting ready to head to North Carolina when an employee from United Airlines that was on the tarmac noticed a dark grey metallic aircraft hovering over one of the gates. After this, 11 other employees and even a few people who didn't work there saw this grey saucer floating at around 4.15 pm. The people who saw it explained that it hovered above the gate for about 5 minutes before it just shot itself upwards and broke through the clouds, leaving a hole in the clouds where you could see the blue sky through. The strangest thing however is that this flying saucer did not show up on the radar, but the Federal Aviation Administration just called it a weather phenomena and would not investigate it despite there being around 15 witnesses who all saw the same thing. This story however became the most read story on the Chicago Tribune's website and even went international because it certainly is very interesting. You also think at an airport they just want to, you know, investigate strange occurrences, you would hope. In our number 7 spot today we have the Lubbock incident. On August 25th, 1951 in Lubbock, Texas, a group of scientists from Texas Technical College were all hanging out in the backyard of geology professor Dr. W.I. Robinson. They were all just chilling, enjoying each other's company, until around 9.20pm when they saw something strange. It was a V-shaped formation of 15 to 30 bluish green lights that were passing overhead. They were completely confused over what it could be, but figured that the lights would likely reappear, which they did. About an hour later the lights reappeared and at this point all of the scientists knew that they had witnessed something exceptionally interesting, but what was it? The scientists weren't the only ones to witness the lights either. About 350 miles away in Albuquerque, New Mexico, an employee of the Atomic Energy Commission's top secret Sandia Corporation, who had a high level Q security clearance, had been sitting outside with his wife, quote, gazing at the night sky, commenting on how beautiful it was, when both of them were 
were startled at the sight of a huge airplane flying swiftly and silently over their home. On the aft edge of the wings, there were six to eight pairs of soft, glowing bluish lights. There were more sightings as well, all reporting a very similar thing. The group of scientists began investigating, tracking the lights, which they witnessed 12 more times. They measured the angle of the lights, they tracked the speed, and they attempted, unsuccessfully, to try and measure the UFO's altitude. Here's the deal with this though. The government did end up coming to investigate, but the official explanation for these lights is the most cryptic message I've ever seen. It read, quote, I thought that the professor's lights might have been some kind of birds reflecting the light from mercury vapor street lights, but I was wrong. They weren't birds, they weren't refracted light, but they weren't spaceships. The lights that the professors saw have been positively identified as a very commonplace and easily explainable natural phenomenon. I can't divulge exactly the way the answer was found because it is an interesting story of, of how a scientist set up complete instrumentation to track down the lights. Telling the story would lead to his identity and in exchange for his story, I promised the man complete anonymity. Despite people claiming that this mystery has been solved, by this explanation, people are left with a lot more questions than answers. In our number six spot today, we have the Foo Fighters. On a late November evening in 1944, nearing the end of the Second World War, Lieutenant Fred Ringwald was riding as observer in a night fighter that was being piloted by Lieutenant Edge Luter with Lieutenant Donald J. Myers on radar. The men were in the Rhine Valley, which sits north of Strasbourg on the French and German border, when Lieutenant Ringwald saw something. He said, quote, I wonder what those lights are over there in the hill. When the rest turned to look, they saw eight to ten fiery orange glowing lights. They checked with the ground radar, but nothing was registering. The men thought that there was a chance that these lights could be some kind of air weapon, so they turned themselves to be ready to fight, only to have the lights suddenly vanish. The three men who experienced the strange lights at first didn't tell anyone about what they saw because they feared being ostracized by those around them. This all changed, however, when stories of similar sightings began to spread through their unit. As it would turn out, many other pilots and flight crews experienced the same orange glowing lights, and one pilot even experienced a strange cigar-shaped flying object. In this instance, the UFO was described as, quote, a wingless cigar-shaped object glowing red just a few yards off the plane's wingtip. Lieutenant Krasny, justifiably spooked, instructed the pilot to attempt evasive maneuvers, but the glowing object stayed right next to the jet for several minutes before it flew off and disappeared. Throughout the years, the explanations for what these people saw have ranged from things like combat fatigue to the works of Nazi astrophysicists. So at this point, what exactly happened here remains quite a mystery. Number 10. Recent Sighting Middletown was shaken by an extraordinary event last month as residents reported witnessing a display of rotating green lights hovering above them. The inexplicable sighting, which occurred around 10.30 p.m., left many in awe and pondering the possibility of extraterrestrial activity. One individual, Caden Little, managed to capture the event on video while on Jerry Couch Boulevard. Caden described his initial reaction as a mix of fear and fascination, exclaiming, I instantly thought like we're under attack by aliens. It was scary. Fortunately, the lights abruptly disappeared without any hostile action, providing some relief. Eyewitnesses, including Bryce Garrick, observed the lights rotating in a clockwise motion before swiftly darting across the sky and vanishing. The bewildering speed at which the lights maneuvered ruled out the possibility of drones, according to Brian Simpson, president of the Cincinnati Astronomical Society. So what was it? Who knows? But my bet is aliens. Number 9. The Coin Incident At 7.30pm on October 18, 1973, American Airlines Flight 21 encountered a UFO near Mansfield, Ohio and reported it. This would be the first of dozens of sightings reported in the area that night. However, the most astonishing one took place three hours later and became known as the Coin Incident. Sometime after 10.30pm, an Army Reserve helicopter piloted by Captain Lawrence Coyne and a crew of three men was flying from Columbus to Cleveland when someone around Mansfield, they noticed a red light on the horizon. They then realized that the object was heading straight for them at a high rate of speed. Coin quickly descended to avoid collision, but as the men were preparing for impact, the object came to a halt in front of them and projected a green, pyramid-shaped beam over the helicopter. 
the same time this was happening, the men reported the helicopter being pulled up and towards the UFO. However, it then let go and darted out of sight. The incident lasted 5 minutes. The men described a grey metallic looking dome shaped object with a red light on one end and white light on the other. Now interestingly, after the incident, according to one crew member, the helicopter never worked right again. Now this whole incident was seen from the ground by a mother and her two children who pulled their car over to watch what was going on. They reported seeing the helicopter chasing an object that they said looked like a limp, paired shaped and as big as a school bus. Number 8. Earliest Photographs a photo taken in St. Paris, Champaign County in 1932 is considered one of the earliest possible photographs of a UFO ever recorded. It shows George Sutton, a local resident, in what appears to be a classic UFO shaped object over his left shoulder. Skeptics say the object is simply a street lamp, but according to the folklore that surrounds this image, there were no electric street lights along this road in 1932, nor are any wires or poles visible in the image. Now, this photo is intriguing because it predates the flying saucer craze of the late 1940s and 50s. It was taken before the alleged Roswell UFO crash in 1947, and it was six years prior to the broadcast of the War of the Worlds in 1938, when some people believed aliens were attacking Earth. In other words, the person who took this photograph either captured a street lamp, a real UFO, or was way ahead of the curve in terms of pulling off a good hoax. But I'd like to think it's a real UFO. Number 7. The Carnival as a way to raise money, Father Gregory Miller decided to host a carnival in August of 1949. The church sought help from Sergeant Donald R. Berger, and on the first night of the carnival, sometime after 8 p.m., he was operating the searchlight when it came upon a massive object in the sky. His log states the object was stationary, appearing as a glowing disc. When I moved the searchlight away, the disc continued to glow. He estimated the object to be around 25,000 feet high, and reported that the sky was clear with a thin haze at altitude. More than 100 people saw the object that night, including Father Miller. Maybe nothing more would have come from this incident, but the next day, local newspapers carried stories about strange lights being reported all over Cincinnati, not just at the carnival. At least three major newspapers in the area ran stories about the sighting, so it definitely was something. Number 6. 86 Mile Police Chase in Portage Country in 1966, law enforcement officers from several jurisdictions either witnessed or chased a UFO for 86 miles into Pennsylvania. The incident is considered one of the most thoroughly documented UFO cases on record. Portage County Sheriff Deputy Dale Sparr and second deputy named Wilbur Neff came upon the UFO around 5.30 a.m. on April 17th. They were investigating an abandoned vehicle and they heard a humming or buzzing noise behind them and they turned to see a UFO hovering just above a nearby tree. Line. A bright cone shaped light came from beneath the object, illuminating the ground. They called into dispatch, which told them to keep an eye on the object. Just then, the object began to quickly move away. The two decided to give chase, and near the state line, a local police officer saw the object, followed by Spur and Neff chasing it. He decided to join in on the action. However, a short time later, just as the sun was rising, Spur began to run out of gas, so he and Neff and the local police officer pulled into a gas station where they watched the object ascend several thousand feet into the sky and then straight into outer space and well that was that number five october 11th 1973 October 11th was quite the night for Ohio residents as there were many UFO spotted. In Dayton, at least 15 sightings were reported. Many witnesses reported seeing objects covered with red, green, and blue lights hovering over treetops in the area. A Montgomery County Sheriff's deputy reported seeing an oblong object covered with lights that appeared stationary in the sky at treetop level for several minutes until he tried to shine his cruiser spotlight on it. It then zoomed towards him and then shot straight up in the sky. Then in Troy, according to an article in the Columbus Dispatch from October 12, 1973, titled UFO Reports Proceed Boom on October 11th, Troy Patrolman Early Thomas and about 100 Troy residents said they watched a hovering red, green, and white object move across the southeastern sky. Now, just to note, this happens to be the direction of Wright Patterson. About 15 minutes later, law enforcement agencies in Miami, Champaign, and Logan counties received hundreds of telephone calls after a sonic boom was heard. They received more calls when a second sonic boom was heard just after midnight, and it seems like the aliens had something special planned for that day to me. <laughs>
Number 4. Trumbull County UFO Incident Featured on the History Channel and numerous UFO documentaries, the Trumbull County UFO Incident in Northeast Ohio is exceptional because it was witnessed by numerous police officers and a 911 dispatcher, all of whom were being recorded as they spoke back and forth about the strange events unfolding the evening of December 14, 1994. It was also seen by many members of the public as well. Now, around midnight, Trumbull County 911 began receiving calls from residents about strange low flying lights in the sky. The dispatcher sent out Liberty Townsman police officers to investigate. One of them was Sergeant Toby Melro, who saw a light. He got out of his car and looked up to see what he described as a giant circular shaped object and intensely bright in the center section. It made no sound at all. The object was there for about 30 seconds before moving away. Shaken, Sergeant Melro decided to chase the object, as did many other police officers in the area. At least 14 law enforcement officers saw the object that night, with all of them discussing it openly on their radios. Number 3. 1973 There were many UFO sightings in 1973 in Ohio and its surrounding states. For example, in Columbus on September 30th, a Franklin County man claims to have discovered a landing site near his home after seeing a strange object in the sky. Weeds at the alleged site are crushed to the ground in a semi-oval area 20 by 30 feet wide. The man says the object whooped down in a zigzag pattern and dropped below the trees. There are several dozen sightings of strange objects in the sky reported in the area that night. Then in Middletown on October 7th, a giant orange colored cigar shaped object with five discs following it and making no sound is reported flying over the city at 10pm. Many people see it and Wright Patterson receives numerous calls. Now these are just two examples of that year, but there are many, many more. Number 2. Circleville on August 26, 2022, Pete Hartinger said UFOs were spotted in the area. An expert on the topic who has seen a UFO with his own eyes, Pete said several people reported seeing UFOs between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m., including a man who saw something in the sky as he was traveling on US 23 north of Circleville. He saw strange lights and going on down, he saw some more strange lights. He knows some other people who saw them too, he said. The man said it wasn't right the way the lights were acting. The lights came down, hit the ground, and went back up. So forget about them being flares. Pete said the man, who wishes to remain anonymous, reported what he saw to the Roundtown UFO Society, a local group dedicated to studying these matters. Anybody who has seen strange, mysterious lights that have been in the sky, please let us know, he said. He said at least half a dozen people saw the lights. One person said they saw orange lights over the fairgrounds, he said, and another person said he saw some military aircraft coming in after he saw those lights. Were they coming in to investigate, or what? Since 1947, there have been several sightings of UFOs in the Circleville area, which is strange. And coming in at number one is Ohio is a beacon. According to the Mutual UFO Network of Ohio, MUFIN, the state ranks among the top 10 states in UFO reports. Thomas Wortman with the MUFIN said, It's all sorts of things we get. We get the individual who is out walking their dog at night who reports seeing unusual lights that they just can't explain. They see the lights for a few seconds or minutes and they just want an answer. Now, the majority of these reports come from Northeast Ohio, and Thomas says about 80% of what comes in the agency can be explained. Explained, but about 20% and up being classified as UFOs. Now, if you're waiting for the government to admit that aliens do exist, don't hold your breath because the time reports that the Pentagon isn't going to say that. But my question is, what is so special about Ohio? In our number five spot today, we have the big flap. Back in 1952, while the panic over flying saucers was real, there was a bunch of strange reports of potential UFO sightings over the skies of Washington, D.C. These sightings later became known as the Big Flap, and they were being reported by civilians as well as military radar operators and pilots. In fact, there were so many people reporting these UFOs that a special intelligence unit of the U.S. Air Force was sent in to investigate. What really sparked a lot of concern with these sightings is when radar operators at National watched the objects fly past the White House and the Capitol building. This is when two F-94 interceptor jets were sent to investigate, but both times as they approached the mysterious objects showing on their radar screens, they would just suddenly disappear. In the end, as a result of the investigation, what they found, or really 
the lack of what they found, combined with the official explanation that was released, only worked to fuel some early conspiracy theories that the government was working to hide the evidence that proves the existence of alien life. In our number 4 spot today we have the disappearance. Frederick Valentich was an Australian pilot who disappeared under some unbelievably suspicious circumstances on a training flight on October 21st, 1978. During the flight, he radioed the Melbourne Air Traffic Control to let them know that he was being accompanied by an aircraft that was about a thousand feet above him and at the same time that his engine had begun to run roughly. Air Traffic Control responded to him by explaining that there was no known air traffic at that level and Frederick explained that he could see a large unknown aircraft with four bright landing lights. He explained the aircraft approached him from the east and at first thought it was another pilot playing around with him. For the record, during a flight seems like a terrible time for someone to play a prank. He then went on to explain that the mysterious aircraft was orbiting him and had a green light on it. When air traffic control tried to get further details and asked what kind of aircraft it was, Frederick responded by saying, it's not an aircraft. After this, his radio transmission was interrupted by a metallic scraping sound, and this is when all contact was lost. Sea and air search began, but to no avail. There have been speculations that don't involve alien abductions, such as a staged disappearance, the possibility of Frederick getting confused and flying upside down, and potentially even him taking his own life. All of these theories have been debunked in some sort of way, and neither the aircraft or Frederick himself have ever been found. The reason why alien abduction has been the main theory in this case is due to the fact that many reported UFO sightings came on the same night in the same region as his disappearance. It of course leaves us with more questions than answers, but it is all very interesting and very mysterious. In our number 3 spot today we have Apollo 11. We can sit here on Earth all day and talk about the potential for alien life, talk about UFO sightings, but who would know more than people who have actually been to space? Which are of course astronauts. Definitely on the list of coolest and scariest jobs in the entire world, there haven't been a ton of people who have had the unbelievable privilege of experiencing space firsthand, but there are even less of them who have claimed to see something that seems completely unexplainable. People who have claimed these sort of things include Edgar Mitchell, Catherine Coleman, and Dr. Brian O'Leary. The very interesting part about many of these claims is that they also include some sort of government cover-up as well. There was also Buzz Aldrin who spoke about his Apollo 11 experience and he detailed the crew seeing something flying alongside them and at first they believed it was the final stage of a detached rocket but then mission control confirmed that it was actually 6,000 miles away from them leaving them with no answers on what the flying object could be. I can't imagine going to space at all, let alone encountering a UFO flying right beside you. In our number 2 spot today we have the FBI documents. In a video that was released by the hacktivist group Anonymous a few years ago, they discussed some sort of FBI documents that are apparently declassified and just sitting on the website waiting for anyone to come across. These documents apparently suggested that we not only have been visited by aliens, but also by beings from other dimensions. This document was sent in 1947 and while it didn't originate from within the FBI, it was sent in by a university department head and it was treated with the utmost importance by the FBI. The document goes on to say that the aliens that have visited aren't from a planet as we think of it, but rather some sort of etheric planet that inter that interpenetrates with our own, but we just aren't able to perceive it. They are able to consciously make the decision to enter our plane and in the same respect exit it whenever they want. The document says that all visits are peaceful and that they are for the purpose of scoping out our planet as they might want to call it home one day. This certainly is one of those things that you have to draw your own conclusions from, and while it's good to remain skeptical, it's also imperative that we keep our minds open, because who are we to say for sure? In our number one spot today, we have the 2021 UFO. On February 21st of 2021, a blogger was using a radio scanner to try and pick up the feed from an aircraft when he received much more than he ever expected. He intercepted the transmission of the wrong aircraft, but at the right time. As an American Airlines flight was headed from Cincinnati to Phoenix around 1.19 p.m., the pilot came on the radio to ask the question, do you have any targets up here? We just had something go right over top of us. After this, he followed up with, I hate to say this, but it looked like a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast right over the top of us. Not only were FAA air traffic controllers not able to see any object in the area on their radar scope, but they still have been unable to identify exactly what it could have been. This does happen more often than any of us really know, and it is possible that the object could have been a part of some covert military or navy operation, but it certainly raises some alarm 
alarm bells that it was unable to be tracked in any sort of capacity. I wonder if this is one of those stories that will remain a mystery, or if one day we'll maybe get some sort of answers as to what exactly happened. In our number 5 spot today we have the Mount Rainier incident. This incident took place when Kenneth Arnold was en route from Chehalis, Washington to Yakima, Washington on June 24th, 1947. Kenneth was traveling in a privately owned plane when he suddenly saw a bright flash on his wing. He looked around and this is when he saw a chain of 9 unidentified flying objects approaching Mount Rainier. He explained that he quote, could see their outline quite plainly against the snow as they approached the mountain. He continued on saying quote, they flew very close to the mountain tops, directly south to southeast down the hogs back of the range, flying like geese in a diagonal chain like line as if they were linked together. From here he explained that quote, they were approximately 20 or 25 miles away and I couldn't see a tail on them. I watched for about 3 minutes, a chain of saucer like things at least 5 miles long swerving in and out of the high mountain peaks. They were flat like a pie pan and so shiny they reflected the sun like a mirror. He also told investigators that he had never seen anything travel that fast in his life. Unfortunately, Kenneth's story was met with disbelief and actually a lot of ridicule. This made Kenneth quite resentful, but he said, quote, they can call me Einstein, Flash Gordon, or just a screwball, but I am absolutely certain of what I saw. He added that if he ever saw a phenomena in the sky, quote, even if it were a 10 story building flying through the air, he would not say a word about it. In our number four spot today, we have the fossilized microbes. Another piece of controversial evidence that came from Mars was announced in 1996. NASA scientists announced that they had potentially found what appeared to maybe fossilized microbes in a lump of Martian rock. It is likely that this rock came off during some sort of Mars collision and just casually floated around the solar system for, I don't know, 15 million years before landing in Antarctica in 1984. You know, just casual space stuff. After analyzing the rock, it was revealed that it contained organic molecules and small specks of mineral magnetite, which sometimes is found in the bacteria on Earth. Upon further analysis with an electron microscope, it was claimed that there were signs of nanobacteria. Since then, some claim that the magnetite wasn't that similar to those found in bacteria, and that there is a belief that the signs of nanobacteria could have been grown in a lab. In our number 3 spot today, we have the big flap. Back in 1952, while the panic over flying saucers was very real, there were a bunch of strange reports of potential UFO sightings in the skies of Washington, D.C. These sightings later became known as the big flap, and they were being reported by civilians as well as military radar operators and pilots. In fact, there were so many people reporting these UFOs that a special intelligence unit of the U.S. Air Force was sent to investigate. What really sparked a lot of concern with these sightings is when radar operators at National watched the objects fly past the White House and Capitol building. This is when two F-94 interceptor jets were sent to investigate, but both times, as they approached the mysterious objects, showing on their radar screens, they would just suddenly disappear. In the end, as a result of the investigation, what they found, or really the lack of findings, combined with the official explanation that was released, only worked to fuel some very early conspiracy theories that the government was working to hide the evidence that proves the existence of alien life. In our number 2 spot today we have Europa. One of Jupiter's moons called Europa has a red tinge to it, and in 2001 NASA scientists revealed that it's possible that alien microbes might be responsible for this red color. The surface of the moon is mostly ice, but it has been shown that it reflects infrared radiation in a very bizarre way. This means that something is binding it together, but researchers haven't been able to come up with the correct combination of elements and compounds to make the data make sense. There are some bacteria on Earth that can thrive in extreme conditions, and that also have that red and brown color, which could potentially be responsible for the color on this moon. The surface temperature might be too cold for them to survive, but the warmer interior might be where they are actually located. Some geological activity on the moon could then push them closer to the surface, where they are then flash frozen in place. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the astronaut sightings. We can sit here on Earth all day and talk about the potential for alien life, but who knows more than the people who have actually been to space, which of course are astronauts. Definitely on the list of coolest and scariest jobs in the entire world, there haven't been a ton of people who have had the unbelievable privilege of experiencing space firsthand. But there are even less of them who have claimed to see something that could potentially be proof of alien existence. People who have claimed these sort of things include Edgar Mitchell, Catherine Coleman, and Dr. Brian O'Leary. The very interesting part about many of these claims is that they also include some sort of government cover up as well. There was also Buzz Aldrin who spoke about his Apollo 11 experience and he detailed 
the crew seeing something flying alongside them, and at first they believed it was the final stage of a detached rocket, but then Mission Control confirmed that it was actually 6,000 miles away from them, leaving them with no answers on what the flying object could actually be. I can't imagine going to space at all, let alone encountering a UFO flying right beside me. Also, I can't believe that I hadn't heard of that story before, because to me, that sounds like full-blown alien contact. In our number 5 spot today, we have the 2021 UFO. On February 21st of 2021, a blogger was using a radio scanner to try and pick up the from an aircraft when he received much more than he ever expected. He intercepted the transmission of the wrong aircraft, but at the right time. As an American Airlines flight was headed from Cincinnati to Phoenix around 1.19pm, the pilot came on the radio to ask the question, do you have any targets up here? We just had something go right over top of us. After this, he followed up with, I hate to say this, but it looked like a long cylindrical object that almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast right over the top of us. Not only were FAA air traffic controllers not able to see any object in the area on their radar scope, but they still have been unable to identify exactly what it could have been. This does happen more often than any of us really know, and it is possible that the object could have been a part of some covert military or navy operation, but it certainly raises some alarm bells that it was unable to be tracked in any sort of capacity. I wonder if this is one of those stories that will remain a mystery, or if one day we'll get some sort of answers as to what exactly happened here. In our number 4 spot today, we have the 2023 sighting. This UFO video was taken recently on January 22nd, and the video was posted to Reddit by a user called MaxKeller96, and with the video, they gave some context. Quote, My sister, dad, and I were out hiking near Picket Post when one of us noticed something glimmering near the mountain, so we stopped to look at it. All I could really make out is that it was a small bright dot in the sky. After a good 15 seconds of staring at it, just silently hanging in the air, or trying to figure out what the f was, I started recording. Sorry it's shaky, I could barely see my phone screen and was trying to get a good look at it with my own eyes. It then dropped two flare looking things, though my sister swears she counted at least three, and that it instantly sped off heading south-ish. Up until that point I thought it might have been a helicopter or a drone, as, as there is a lot of military slash air force base stuff out here, but there's no way anything can accelerate that fast. We all lost sight of it nearly instantly after video cuts, and we were all properly freaked out about it. I've replayed the video probably a hundred times and tried showing it to everyone I know, and no one had any idea what it could be other than a super high-end drone. If you think you know, please let me know. After watching the video also probably a hundred times, I can definitely say that I have no idea what they all saw that day, because I also really don't think it was a drone. I also have to say that this video even gathered people together on Reddit, and that is no easy feat. Redditors are ruthless, and often very skeptical, and still people are pretty on board and confused over what this could have been. In our number 3 spot today, we have the USS Princeton UFO. This UFO sighting comes from 2004, but footage of it was released in 2017. On November 14th of 2004, the USS Princeton noticed an unknown aircraft of some sort that was about 100 miles off of the coast of San Diego. For two weeks prior to this, this crew had been tracking a strange flying object that would start out around 80,000 feet before extremely quickly dropping to hover right above the Pacific. Pacific Ocean. Black Aces Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate of Strike Fighter Squadron 41 went over in two fighter jets in order to kind of scope out the situation, and when they arrived, they saw what at first appeared to be churning water while there was an oval shape just below the surface. After this, a white oval shaped object appeared above the water, but it had no markings on it, like no windows, nothing that would indicate an engine, no wings, and the infrared monitors on the jets didn't pick up any sort of exhaust, which is a Especially peculiar when we think of what the pilots who just shot down the Alaska UFO said. No propulsion, right? Gives me chills just thinking about it because how could that be possible? The commander and lieutenant commander tried to intercept this strange aircraft, but it very quickly flew away and reappeared on the monitor 60 miles away. Like when I say quickly, I mean it was moving at three times the speed of sound and over twice the speed of the fighter jets. Faster than any kind of technology we currently have. We still don't know exactly what this was because it definitely seems like we don't have the technology to make this sort of thing possible. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Chicago UFO. This UFO sighting comes from November 7th, 2006, and it was at the O'Hare International Airport in Chicago.
Chicago. Flight 446 was getting ready to head to North Carolina when an employee from United Airlines that was on the tarmac noticed a dark grey metallic aircraft hovering over one of the gates. After this, 11 other employees and even a few people who didn't work there saw this grey saucer floating at around 4.15pm. The people who saw it explained that it hovered above the gate for about 5 minutes before it just shot itself upwards and broke through the clouds, leaving a hole in the clouds where you could see the blue sky through. The strangest thing however is that this flying saucer did not show up on the radar, so the Federal Aviation Administration just called it a weather phenomena and would not investigate it despite there being around 15 witnesses who all saw exactly the same thing. This story did however become one of the most read stories on the Chicago Tribune's website and even went international because it certainly is very interesting. And finally in our number one spot we have the Stephenville UFO. In January of 2008 in the small town of Stephenville, Texas, a bunch of residents all saw something in the sky that they couldn't believe. In the beginning it appeared to be white lights in the sky that were first in a single arc, but then they quickly moved to form two parallel lines. It was estimated that the lights were spanning about a mile long and half a mile wide. Craziest part is that it was flying at 3,000 miles per hour, which is similar to the speed of a fighter jet, but there was no sound reported at all. The government chalked this sighting up to the US Air Force flight operation, but many of the residents who saw this event on that day were absolutely not convinced and truly felt like they were lied to. Some even explained that what they saw was too technologically advanced for the human civilization. In our number 5 spot today we have the Rendlesham Forest Incident. This incident is often referred to as Britain's Roswell Incident and it took place in December of 1980. The incident took place in the Rendlesham Forest which is a pine forest in England that at the time sat in between two United States Air Force bases, RAF Bentwaters and RAF Woodbridge. Over several nights around this time of year actually, a number of credible military personnel reported strange and colourful lights both above as well as in the forest. Some of those who were sent to investigate the strange lights reported seeing a triangular craft at close range and there was even a famous audio tape made of the encounter. After these happenings, the UK Ministry of Defence claimed that the incident posed no threat to national security and because of that, it was never investigated further. What really happened in the forest all those years ago remains a total mystery, but those who actually witnessed the lights and the aircraft are said to have remained totally baffled. In our number 4 spot today we have the unexplained UFO. In 2017, after the existence of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program became more well known, a video was released of an encounter between an FA-18 Super Hornet and some sort of unidentified flying object. There weren't a ton of details released about exactly what happened during this encounter, but using the Raytheon Advanced Targeting Forward Looking infrared pod, they were able to capture an extremely fast moving white oval that was around 45 feet long. The oval had no wings and it didn't appear to have any kind of exhaust either. They were tracking the UFO at an altitude of 25,000 feet just above the Atlantic Ocean and then they were shocked as the craft rotated on its axis and flew away. There was no explanation released with the footage because it truly is unbelievable and currently unexplainable. In our number 3 spot today we have the USS Princeton UFO. This UFO sighting comes from 2004. On November 14th of that year, the USS Princeton noticed an unknown aircraft of some sort that was about 100 miles off of the coast of San Diego. For two weeks prior to this, this crew had been tracking a strange flying object that would start out at around 80,000 feet before extremely quickly dropping to hover right above the Pacific Ocean. Black Aces Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate of Strike Fighter Squadron 41 went over in two fighter jets in order to kind of scope out the situation and when they arrived they saw what at first appeared to be churning water while there was just an oval shape just below the surface. After this a white oval shaped object appeared above the water but it had no markings on it at all. Like no windows, nothing that would indicate an engine, no wings and the infrared monitors on the jet didn't pick up any sort of exhaust. The commander and lieutenant commander tried to intercept this strange aircraft but it very quickly flew away and reappeared on the monitor 60 miles away. Like when I say quickly I mean it was moving at three times the speed of sound and over twice the speed of fighter jets. So faster than any kind of technology we currently have. We still don't know what exactly this was but sure a lot of us are thinking the same thing. In our number 2 spot today we have the cigar shaped UFO. Let's set the stage. It's 2.45am on July 24th 1948 and there are 20 passengers aboard a twin engine propeller plane that is at 5000 feet being flown from Houston to Atlanta by pilot Clarence S. Child 
Wells and co-pilot John B. Witted. Out of the 20 passengers on board, 19 of them are asleep at these early morning hours, and everything seems to be going as per usual until it wasn't. The two pilots and the one passenger who were awake all witnessed the same thing about 20 miles southwest of Montgomery, Alabama. About a week after the incident, the pilot explained what he had seen by saying, quote, It was clear there were no wings present, that it was powered by some jet or other type of power, shooting flames from the rear some 50 feet. There were two rows of windows, which indicated an upper and a lower deck, and from inside these windows, a very bright light was glowing. Underneath the ship, there was a blue glow of light. By his estimates, he watched the UFO for about 10 seconds before it completely vanished. The co-pilot gave a similar explanation and also added, quote, The object was cigar shaped and seemed to be about 100 feet in length. He continues on, quote, I asked Captain Childs what we had just witnessed and he said that he didn't know. While this is obviously very strange and peculiar, what has driven UFO enthusiasts even more is the fact that this strange sighting was of course later investigated by the US government, but the results of that investigation have allegedly been mostly destroyed. Does that mean maybe they found something they aren't willing to share yet? Some people believe that perhaps the pilots and passenger witnessed a secret Soviet spy craft. Others believe it was definitely something of the extraterrestrial variety. In our number one spot today, we have the New Jersey UFO. This UFO sighting took place in 2001, just above the New Jersey Turnpike. On July 14th, 2001, just after midnight for around 15 minutes, motorists driving down this highway stopped to stare at the sky to witness what no one could believe. There were strange or orange and yellow lights in a V formation just above the Arthur Kill waterway. There were a ton of witnesses who were all extremely confused and shocked as to what they were seeing. Air traffic controllers initially denied that there were any flying objects that could have caused the mysterious lights, but a group that is called the New York Strange Phenomena Investigators claimed that they received radar data that night that would corroborate the story that the witnesses were telling. It may not have been aliens, but it certainly was some sort of unidentified flying object that no one had ever seen before and there were people from all walks of life witnessing it together. You're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the two fishermen. On October 11th, 1973, two friends, Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson, decided to go out fishing on a river in Mississippi. That's when a big bright light came out of nowhere. Parker reported, and I quote, it was a blinding light. It was hard to tell with the light so bright, but it looked like it was shaped like a football. I would say just estimating that it was about 80 foot. It made very little sound and it was just a hissing noise. But it gets weirder. He then claims that three legless creatures came out of the vessel and towards the two. They described them as having mitten-shaped claws. One was neckless and gray, the other was more feminine. The friends started to freak out and that's when these creatures wrapped their hands around their neck. Upon doing so, they calmed down. Parker thinks that they were ejected with something and that's why they immediately calmed down. After that, he claims that they went on board the vessel and were experimented on. When they got out of there, they alerted the police, who alerted the military. In fact, the two men were interrogated a number of times because of how wild their story was. Moving on to number four, we have the mutilated sergeant. This story is one that genuinely freaks me out. So back in 1956, an American Air Force Sergeant, Jonathan P. Lovett, and Major William Cunningham were out collecting the debris from a recent missile launch in New Mexico. While doing so, the two separated and decided to go their own ways. After a while, Major William heard his sergeant let out a loud scream. As he rushed towards him, he saw the sergeant being lifted up by a UFO, then pulled him inside the craft before zooming away. When his colleagues found William, he was in complete shock from what he had saw, and he was taken to the hospital. Of course, no one believed him. They were like, there's no way that he was abducted by a UFO, okay. But after researching, they did find that an unidentified object was present on their radar at the time of the abduction. Now, what happened to the abducted man? Well, three days later, his body was found 10 miles away. It was severely mutilated and drained of blood. Isn't that freaky? So it seems like he was literally abducted by aliens and then they killed and ate him or something. What makes this even more suspicious is that the government reports on this just suddenly vanished into thin air. Hmm. Moving on to number three, we have pilot Frederick Valentich. On October 21st, 1978, Australian pilot Frederick Valentich was partaking in a 125 nautical mile training flight when he disappeared into thin air. Now, it's important to note that Frederick was a very experienced pilot. 
So around 7.06 p.m. that night, he radioed his crew, saying that an unidentified craft was following him. He described it as having four bright lights with a shiny metallic exterior. His final words were, it is hovering and it's not an aircraft. Then his signal cut out, Frederick or his craft were never seen again. Now, many people believe that he was shot down or abducted by a UFO. In fact, an unidentified farmer in the area said that he saw a UFO nearly 90 feet in length hovering above his farm. He saw this during the morning of Frederick's disappearance. He then said that he also saw a plane stuck to the UFO leaking oil. Moving on to number two, we have Terrell Copeland. In 2007, former United States Marine Terrell Copeland had his first experience with an alien. He was in his apartment when he saw an orb of light outside. He said, and I quote, it was just a big ball of light. It wasn't moving. One was solid white. The other was directly across the street from it, up 300 feet above ground and was changing colors very rapidly. The next thing he remembers is feeling as though something was wrong and he passed out. When he woke up, he heard someone entering his apartment. The person was moving the doorknob and scratching at the door, trying to get in. He tried getting up from his bed, but he was completely paralyzed. He tried to reach for a weapon that he had, but that's when he heard a voice through the door tell him, you don't need that weapon. We won't harm. When he finally was able to move, he lost four hours of his time. He believes that he was abducted by aliens. He said that he remembers being in a room with a woman who was definitely not human. He said, and I quote, she had the typical black eyes you hear about. She had an elongated skull and that startled me. And the next memory I have is me standing on my balcony waving at this cylinder shaped ship. That's freaky. Did any of you guys have a good alien abduction story? Let me know in the comments below. And in our number one spot today, we have the Boy Scouts. On August 19th, 1952, a Scoutmaster and his Boy Scouts were on their way home from a retreat when they encountered a bright flash near West Palm Beach, Florida. The Scouts Master originally thought it was a downed plane or a car accident, so he pulled over and got out to help. He told the Scouts to stay in the car and alert someone if he didn't return in 15 minutes. So he got out with his flashlight and an ax and went towards where he saw the bright lights. This ended up taking him to a wooded area. About four minutes in, he started to smell something very nauseating. Then he felt like he was being watched by somebody. The next thing he remembers is feeling heat on the top of his body. He looked up and saw a hovering glowing object above him. He started to back away from the craft when he heard a noise like metal against metal. A hatch then opened and he saw a red flare come out towards him. The next thing he knew, he was unconscious. When he awoke, he was leaning against a tree but was completely blind. His eyes had been burned by the light. When authorities found him, he was incoherent, terrified, and freaking out. Stories like this trip me out because like if it wasn't an alien or a UFO, then what was it, you know? All right guys, that's all for today's video. Let me know in the comments below, do you believe in aliens? How about after this list, do you believe in them now? And with that being said, smash that like button and subscribe to Most Amazing Top 10 for more amazing videos. I've been your host, Lindsay Ivan, and I'll see you when I see ya. Bye. Not when I'm doing scary stories. God, did you hear that? A neighbor banged my door. <laughs> Fuck. <sighs> Want to see more videos like this one? Check out this video next. It's about sightings of the thought to be extinct creature, the Titanoboa. Now this creature was thought to be extinct for the last couple of million years, but there has been some concerning footage that might show that it's still alive and well. Click the video now to find out more. See you in the next video.